So the other day I was watching this YouTube video about this very famous US Supreme Court case made by this very good YouTuber named Big Joel. The case involves this courthouse in Kentucky that put up a display of the Ten Commandments. And in response, the US justice system was like, no, you can't do that because the Ten Commandments are a religious thing and the courthouse is a government thing. And therefore putting them up would violate the separation of church and state. And then the courthouse was like, okay, but what if I put up a bunch of historical stuff around the Ten Commandments, so it is no longer a religious display, but rather a historical one. And the Supreme Court ultimately said, no, you are clearly just trying to fool us into letting you put up a religious thing. And Big Joel does a good job of talking about how this ruling kind of gets into these weird, almost metaphysical questions of how you can ever fully prove someone's intent. But the thing I was most interested in when I saw this video was, hey, what are those other historical things that they put up around the Ten Commandments to make it seem less religious? Well, it was actually a display of nine different historical documents that the courthouse people decided were the foundations of American law and government. And in the aftermath of the Ten Commandments ruling, I learned that it has actually become fashionable in some of the more conservative parts of America to actually display these same nine documents in public buildings. We're talking about places like schools and government buildings and even courthouses. <coughs> kind of a passive aggressive protest to the ruling. Anyway, let us look at these nine documents together and talk about why they were probably chosen. And at the end, you can tell me if you think these are actually fair choices for the foundations of American law and government. So the first document is, of course, the Ten Commandments themselves. These are ten rules for moral living as presented by Moses in the book of Exodus. And and since Exodus is of course part of the Old Testament, we can say that these are 10 explicitly Judeo-Christian rules for moral living. This was the root of the original controversy. If you consider America to be a fundamentally Judeo-Christian country, then of course it makes perfect sense to consider a Judeo-Christian religious document to be part of the foundation of American law. If you don't, then this just seems very presumptuous and disrespectful to Americans of other religions or no religion. The first four commandments are all about recognizing the existence of a single God and the need to worship that God in a particular way. The worshiping part is obviously problematic, but the need to recognize the existence of a God is something that is a little bit more entrenched in the American legal tradition. But don't worry, we will be returning to this sticky topic in a lot more detail later. There is also a commandment against murder, a commandment against theft, and a commandment against perjury. These are some of the most serious crimes in America, and a lot of folks would argue that that's proof enough that America has a big Judeo-Christian influence in its legal traditions. All right, less controversial is document number two, which is the Magna Carta. Magna Carta is a law of England, still technically on the books, that was ratified by King John way back in 1215. It was the result of a 13th century power struggle between John and the rest of the English nobility who resented his cruel and corrupt style of government. So eventually the nobles forced the king at sword point to concede to a big long list of demands about how he was going to run the government better from now on. The list of demands is very hard to understand today, in part because language is just so different now, and also because all of the nobles' complaints centered around political disputes that are like 800 years old. But you can still get the gist. A lot of the demands involve creating a clear, predictable system of legal rights for people who are not the king. So even though the particulars are not really relatable, Magna Carta can still be appreciated as like the first big English legal document to outline a few big important ideas. Here, this is Margaret Thatcher's summary. The demand that power be limited and accountable. The determination that force shall not override justice. The conviction that individual human beings have an absolute moral worth which government must respect. All right, number three is Lady Justice. Lady Justice is this mythical character in English culture who has sort of evolved over the centuries. She is supposed to have her roots in the minor Roman goddess Justitia, who then evolved into a more generic symbol of Christian virtue in the Middle Ages, which then evolved into the more modern character we know today. These days you often see big statues of her outside American courthouses or pictures of her inside courtrooms and this sort of thing. In her modern form, Lady Justice is usually depicted with three iconic accessories, the scale, the sword, and the blindfold, all of which are said to embody various timeless principles of English justice. People do dispute the exact meaning of these accessories since their roots are so ancient, 
but I would say the conventional explanation goes something like, the sword represents that the law is powerful and sometimes harsh. The scales represent how our justice system is based around balancing evidence and being fair. And people usually say that the blindfold represents the idea that justice is blind, although what that specifically means is somewhat up for debate. Some people say it means that our justice system shouldn't care who you are in regard to race or gender or wealth or anything like that. Other people would say it means that our justice system isn't really concerned with consequences, only abstract principles, which is a more controversial idea these days. Next we have document number four, which is the Mayflower Compact. Many Americans peg the symbolic start of their country to the Mayflower Voyage of 1620, which was a ship that brought a bunch of mostly British immigrants to the eastern coast of North America. The voyage wasn't an official mission planned by the British government, which meant that the colonists were kind of on their own. And so near the end of the trip, a bunch of the passengers got together and signed something called the Mayflower Compact. This document is often understood as one of the first statements of American democracy. Since the Mayflower colonists were not operating under any sort of government direction, they understood that they would have to do things for themselves. So in the compact, they declare themselves to have the power to to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinance, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony. And when they finally got to America, they kept that promise. The Mayflower people governed themselves as a small democratic colony for nearly 70 years before one of the larger British colonies eventually annexed them. Which leads us to document number five, the Declaration of Independence. By 1776, the British colonies in America had grown big and successful, but were also growing increasingly resentful of the way that the British government was running their affairs. So a bunch of the leading colonial politicians of the time got together and wrote a big letter of protest. This was the Declaration of Independence, and it basically has two parts. The first part is the preamble, which is the famous part that everybody knows. It basically describes the Founding Fathers' general philosophy of what government is. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. But then there's the rest, which is this big long list of 27 specific complaints about the British government, mostly relating to the style of government that was practiced by King George III. This stuff is not as well remembered today. That's because much like Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence is full of a lot of very specific complaints that relate to a very specific period of time that a lot of us can't really relate to anymore because it happened so long ago. For example, this is one of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence. The King has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records, for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. But much like Magna Carta, these days you are also supposed to appreciate the Declaration of Independence by reading through the lines of it. You are supposed to notice certain principles of law that are still relevant today, even if the specific examples seem very exotic. And a lot of these principles involve the idea that when the executive branch of the government is too strong, which is to say when the king or governor or prime minister or president has too much unchallenged power, the rights of the people generally suffer. This is why, incidentally, even in England, legal scholars take the Declaration of Independence seriously as part of their own legal tradition, as opposed to some foreign thing, because they would see it as a group of Englishmen asserting their rights as Englishmen in protest to a government that was violating the understood norms of proper English law. All right, number six is the Bill of Rights. When the American colonies separated from Great Britain, they wrote a new constitution for themselves, but it wasn't good enough. So under the reign of George Washington, the new American Congress passed a bunch of constitutional amendments outlining the fundamental human rights that are guaranteed to all Americans. I won't describe the rights in too much detail here, because there's a lot of them, and they are still a very active part of American law to this day. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, protection from cruel and unusual punishment, these are all Bill of Rights things. The US Bill of Rights was the first modern attempt to articulate the fundamental human rights enjoyed by all peoples, and in that sense, it was one of the most influential things America has ever done. Nowadays, almost every country in the world has something like the Bill of Rights in their own constitution, often written in very similar language. Number seven is the preamble to your state's 
Constitution. As I'm sure you know, every state in the US has its own constitution. And much like the Declaration of Independence, every state constitution begins with a little preamble that describes that state's general philosophy of government. Most of the state preambles are very similar to one another. The preamble to the New York Constitution is a very standard example. We the people of the state of New York, grateful to Almighty God for our freedom, in order to secure its blessings, do establish this constitution. They all basically repeat the same principle that the power of government comes from the people. And often, but not always, there is also an acknowledgement that the rights of the people come from God. All right, number eight is the lyrics to the US National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. I really do not understand why this was considered one of the foundational documents of American law and government. The Star Spangled Banner is a perfectly nice song, but it has no legal status in America. In fact, it's not even about American law or government in any way. It's just a song about the American victory in the War of 1812. But it does have some connection to document number nine, which is the national motto of the United States. So the national motto of the United States on all of the coins and whatnot is of course, in God we trust. This phrase made its first appearance in the Star Spangled Banner in some of the more obscure lyrics near the end. And ever since then, it has been a popular patriotic motto in the US, particularly when there has been a lot of anxiety about the role of God in American life, like in the aftermath of the Civil War, or during the Cold War, or even amid the growing secularism of our current age. But as religious tensions have grown in the US, six states in the last year have passed laws either allowing or requiring the phrase to be displayed in public schools. As students head back to classrooms, as you said, in Florida, the famous motto is prominent posted on school walls. Lawmakers there made displaying those words mandatory. Similar laws were also passed in Tennessee, Louisiana, and Arkansas. I don't really know if the motto is all that relevant to American law and government either, but it is certainly another thing that plays up the idea of recognizing the supremacy of God as being very central to the United States. So what do you think of these nine things? Do you think that they deserve to be called the foundations of American law and government? As I said at the beginning, the people who are pushing the hardest for this particular suite of documents to be recognized as like the foundational core of American legal history tend to be very concerned conservative people, who of course are also very eager to push the idea that religiosity should be seen as like the central premise of American life. As a result, you probably noticed that one of the consistent themes running through a lot of these documents is their acknowledgement of God. You could very easily argue, in fact, that these documents have been quite explicitly cherry-picked to focus on things that are quite God-centric, even to the point of including pretty dubious stuff like the national motto and the national anthem. And of course the Ten Commandments themselves, which will always be the most controversial inclusion because they not only recognize God, but a very particular Judeo-Christian God. I'm sure a more secular person could come up with a few other legal documents that are maybe a little bit less God-centric. But my question would be, do you think it is fundamentally dishonest to play up God's role in American law this way? I personally have a pretty moderate view on this issue. even though. I I very strongly support the idea of separation of church and state. I don't really have a big problem with the idea of the supremacy of God as a legal concept, because there is a big difference between the legal system acknowledging the existence of some abstract God as the source of all human rights, and the idea of a government that demands acknowledgement of a particular God of a particular religion. The English system of law is based on the premise that rights come from somewhere other than the government, and the existence of a rights-granting God has been offered as the traditional explanation. That's not very philosophically sophisticated, I realize, but it is how things like Magna Carta and the Declaration of Independence justify themselves. So in that sense, the notion of a rights-granting God is part of our legal tradition, and that's worth acknowledging, even if not necessarily in this way. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, do not forget to like and subscribe. Thanks so much to my friend Lance for his beautiful voiceover work in this video. Be sure to check out Lance's political commentary channel, which is called The Surfs. And special shout out to these people here, who are my Patreon subscribers. I like doing videos on somewhat controversial topics now and then, but understandably these ones can be a little bit difficult to get advertising support for. So I really do appreciate anyone who chooses to donate money to this channel through Patreon. Your generosity really does help cover some of the costs associated with making these videos. Anyway, comment away with your thoughts and I will see you all next week. Commandment Uno, I am the Lord thy God. So similar to Commandment Two though, you now knew
Nuno.